welcome to Night Light. Step away from the mainstream and gather around as we enlighten the world and our realities and travel this cosmic journey we call life. Join us as we share with you and provide that beacon that can guide us all to a better way. Explore with us as we examine a metaphysical montage of spiritual insights covering everything from the mundane to the magical, UFOs to unicorns, and everything in between. This is a time of awakening, of sharing and evolving, of spreading our wings and soaring on the cosmic breath of creation. Come and join with other light-minded spirits as we weave our lights together to seek understanding, enlightenment, and with a little luck, some wisdom. This is Night Light, a reminder that you are never alone. Halloween. Welcome to Night Light. Glad you're with us on a special Friday night airing. Uh, unfortunately, it's the last of our Halloween shows, but our quirkiness lasts year-round. Another KCOR friend is stopping by tonight. The Rev is here. The Reverend Sean Whittington is our guest. He is a vet technician, uh, but his other passions are being an international tour guide, doing his Vegas Supernatural show on KCR on Monday nights at 8 p.m. Eastern Time. Uh, Sean Whittington's Paranormal Ministry, which airs on Facebook Sunday nights at 8 p.m. Eastern. Uh, He is an author and an ordained exorcist. You can learn a lot more about the Rev by visiting his website, ghostbegone.biz. That's ghost hyphen, the letter B hyphen gone dot biz. Hi, Rev. How are you? Mr. Eddie, happy All Hallows' Eve to you, sir. How are you? Oh, I'm doing fine. I appreciate you. Yeah, I you. can't complain. I'm hanging in there, too. Um, I don't know who that guy is that you gave that great intro to. I'd love to meet him. <laughs> uh, was our, was uh, our did, interview tonight? <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah uh, <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, I wrote this like five minutes uh, before you called in, so uh, I don't know. Uh, I hope I went to the right website, but I don't know, it could, could be the evil twin. I don't know. We'll, <laughs> we can get into that later, later tonight. Yeah, it, you, you threw me off with the international um, tour guide, and, and then I, I realized what you meant by that, and, and I'm sad that we had to cancel that trip in May to Ireland. Because we just don't know next year what we're yeah. going to be dealing with, you know. And um, uh, I didn't want to be overseas, and God forbid I got sick, and my wife is here in the states, or she gets sick here while I'm over there, and maybe there's, you know, any lockdowns that go in place as I'm over there, or you know, everybody's ready to go on the trip, and maybe they lock down before we get to go, and it has to be canceled anyway. So. I just made the heartbreaking decision a couple of months ago to postpone that to 2022. And so we're going to hope that 2021 is a wonderful year of recovery and, and um, I can eventually make that happen. Yeah. Well, uh, I I hope it happens for you. It looked like an interesting uh, trip and you know, 
Can you talk about uh, your ancestral home? That looks like a neat castle. We'll have to spend some time talking about that over the next couple hours. Absolutely. Uh, no. But, um, yeah, uh, do you think we, we should start the show with a uh, blessing? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Oh, that'd be great, because you know, uh, this is Nightlight Part 2 and 2020, so and it's, you know, we could use all the help we can get. I am. I think what I'll do is, since you and I spoke about some scripture earlier in the week in, mm-hmm. uh, when, we, when we chatted, rather than go right for uh, a too dark of a too dark of a prayer and a blessing i'm just going to throw some nice scripture at us which will set the tone for the listeners and you and i in the show and everybody within the sound of our voice and we will decide how we want this evening to go without any interruptions from powers beyond our control we'll take authority over this. In the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And I saw heaven standing open, and behold, a white horse. And he who sat upon it is called Faithful and True. And with justice he judges and wages war. And his eyes are as a flame of fire. And on his head are many diadems. He has a name written which no man knows except himself. And he is clothed in a garment sprinkled with blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies of heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses. And he has on his garment and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Amen. Amen. Thank thank you. You got it, brother. Okay, let me kind of start off with, um, you know, paraphrasing your KCR uh, colleague, the one and only Solaris, from her show on Sunday, where she gave us a great background on you know, the original meaning of Halloween or Samhain. Um, and she, and she, she, she was talking about you know, people had, uh, you know, the Celtic people were having bonfires for warmth and to extend the light, uh, since the nights were becoming significantly longer. Right? Shows a human need for light in our lives. Um, and, you know. If, the harvest is going on. You know, uh, you, know, uh, you know, today we're bringing like a you know, vegetation uh, you know, to our front porches as we tie the corn stalks to the uh, pillars, and you know, soon we'll be bringing uh, pine trees into the uh, house for Christmas. Uh, you know, we're, it's also the time of the year when the uh, Celtic people were remembering their ancestors. And, uh, about the same time, Native Americans were doing uh, the same thing, return, returning to the mounds, and, uh, and they stamped some of the bones with uh, red ochre. So people um, on both sides of the Atlantic were kind of doing about the same things at the same time. Not you know, not that they were the same people, but you know it's like same ideas. But you know we're still ex- uh, ex- extending uh, daylight by putting up the Christmas lights. It just yeah, you know, nothing really has changed much since the original. Uh, H- Halloween festivals, uh, Easter is kind of like same same thing. Uh, you know, going back to, uh, you know, the Marys went back to uh, 
the tomb and the uh, stone had been rolled away. Basically the same idea. So, um, Sean, where, where, you know, at this time of the year where people were, uh, you know, ancient people were celebrating uh, a, a number of things at this uh, season, where do we get all this uh, uh demonic stuff interpolated over the original intent. Well, you know, people are very fearful, especially back in olden times. And it was just a a way of life. I mean, long before Jesus Christ came here, the world was a very, very, very dark place. And, um, Mm -hmm. Since his arrival and uh, his crucifixion, it's just been an ongoing uh, battle. But even way before that, you know, when um, Satan, who is, for lack of a better term, um, a psychopathic killer, murderer, who actually sat on the throne next to God and then tried to overthrow him, murder him, and then take over heaven, and then you had the great battle. And ultimately, him and his legion were forced out of there and cast down to hell. But many in my field believe that, you know, we live where they were cast down, and this is their world. And the reason why they uh, hate us so much, and I just loosely throw the word hate out there, but how they really feel about us, I don't think I could adequately uh, put it into into words what the depth of that hate really is but we're a constant reminder of who they lost the war to because we are created in god's image but they're always around always influencing always looking for souls to devour and um and whether you uh you just because we are a very spiritual people i think we have uh all of us have to different degrees, of course, but all of us have a certain amount of psychic ability to sense danger and sense that it's around. And you can just look at how ugly and dark the world seems to be right now. Um, it's just, uh, it kind of goes hand in hand with the whole Halloween thing. And a lot of people forget that tonight is actually the worst of the two nights. Uh, I remember growing up in Colts Nick, New Jersey, and the night before Halloween. I can't tell you how many pumpkins that I spent a lot of time carving and making beautiful and putting the candles in them and sticking them out on my porch and as a little kid and being so proud of them only to wake up Halloween day morning and find them all smashed in the street in front of the house because the night before is, you know, thought of as devil's night or mischief night and Mm -hmm. every part of the country has their version of it. And I guess the extreme the extremes that these tricksters would go to would also vary from culture to culture. But um, in, in many parts of the country, tonight can be a very scary night also. So it's always been there. It'll always be there. It's always around us. And so I just think it's kind of uh, interwoven into uh, – into the fabric of of what this is all about, you know, spiritual warfare, the good versus evil, Halloween, and uh, all that spooky sort of stuff. Okay. Um, I'm not being flippant, but uh, being an exorcist isn't a uh, common profession. Um uh, you know, when people find out about that, uh, you know, how do they uh, re- react to you? Well, I have no friends anymore. <laughs> you know, um, it's it's kind of like no, I, I, saying, I, I, oh, I, hey, I, I, I'm a podcaster. 
You get that I, too. I, I, I kid. I have a lot of people that love me, that have known me all my life. But who would I and yeah, who wouldn't? I mean, you know, um I have been doing this for a long time, but I'd still only been the you know, a few years after I met, fell in love with and married my wife that we had an incident happen uh when we were working a paranormal case that thrust me into the spiritual warfare realm and directly got me on this path. And it wasn't until after I was uh, drug into this, basically kicking and screaming, and then started doing research on my own uh, family background and thinking about things that had happened to me when I was very young, that I was meant to do this. And it was all in the cards and part of the journey. It just took me to get into my 50s and have that one incident happen to uh for me to have an awakening so to speak and realize this was uh, the path I was supposed to be on all along you thought you you'll notice that you don't see very many uh 18 year old exorcists usually right. me I believe that it's a calling it has to be a true calling and usually that happens much later in life and that's exactly what happened to me even though uh it was meant to be um, but, you know, it's like uh, I think about Halloween. My wife and I used to celebrate it all the time here. We live in a haunted house. We're probably the oldest residents here in, in our neighborhood, and everybody uh, one time or another has seen some odd things happen in our home, around our home, at our home, and they know what we do. And then we started seeing how kids wouldn't come trick-or-treating here any longer. And those that did come, if there was a knock on the door, we would answer it, and there would be the parents asking for the candy, and the kids would be down on the sidewalk. So we started to not celebrate it so much anymore. Like tonight, tomorrow night, the front porch light will be off. We don't have any decorations out there because the kids stopped coming around. But people that are close to us, once we – and Sharon, my wife, is also a minister – once we jumped on that path, um, people started keeping their distance. They still love us. They pray for us, and we can count on them. They're always there for us, family and close friends. But people tend – you're right. It's Not everybody does it, and especially people that are close to us that know how we got on this path. It's uh, very, very scary to some people, and so they just tend to kind of want to keep their distance. And that's okay. Um, uh, so we it's just we've grown used to the fact that it's going to be this way now. But this was our calling, and this is um, what we do. And um, and it just has something that we've accepted. But people, we don't have a whole lot of we don't do a lot of entertaining, I should say. But we thought about this year for some reason. With the ugliness being at the level, like, unlike anything I've ever seen in my lifetime, the ugliness in the world today, I was going to actually go around. We have a couple of new neighbors in the neighborhood and a couple of old ones have known us for many years. But I was going to bake, do another tradition, a Halloween tradition. I was going to bake some soul cakes. Sharon's a great cook. We were going to do a big batch of soul cakes. And I was going to, on this night, actually, I was going to walk, or early tomorrow, I was going to walk to everybody's home and offer each home one or two of my soul cakes. And if they wanted to while I was on their front porch, say a prayer for them and a prayer for their homestead or pray with them for something in particular if they had um, an intention that they wanted to offer a prayer up for, I was going to do that. But, you know... I can't tell you why we decided not to, but we did, we decided to not do that this year. And uh, it breaks my heart to think that I probably subconsciously decided not to do it because of just the way things are right now with Election Day coming up Tuesday and the world 
everybody's seeming to be split right down the middle. You got, you know, people on one side of the fence, people on the other side of the fence. And um, everybody's a target now. You know, religious, just about every single religious belief system is under attack by somebody. And I know um, who's responsible. Some people buy into that theory. Some people don't. But I know who's responsible for it. So this, for lack of a better phrase, business is booming for me. I had to make another heartbreaking decision earlier in the year when we went into lockdown here in Vegas. Sharon and I decided we weren't going to physically go out and work any paranormal cases, not only out of for, for our own protection because we're – I'm 60, she's 76. We're both in great health, but we're in high risk. We've had our fair share of underlying health issues over the years. For our protection and for the protection of our clients, we decided we would just do counseling. The cases haven't stopped, but now I'm doing more counseling than ever before and trying to help empower people and show people that all along, whether I came to your home or not, all along, you were truly the one that had the power to draw your line in the sand, make a stand, fight back, push the darkness back, and get your life back, that I don't have any magical powers. And so it not only made me a better counselor, which I need to be a better counselor because um, I'm ashamed to admit how many cases I have to cut loose because for whatever reason I can't uh, adequately – express to people what they need to do to help me help them. And I can't get a lot of people on board with me many times. And so I have to cut a lot of cases, as many as I am able to work, just that many or maybe even more I have to cut loose. I either just recommend they continue to search for somebody they're comfortable with or maybe I know somebody that I can refer them to that I think is good for them, is a good fit for them. But that's what we've had to do this year. I'm hoping next year we can physically go out and start working more cases, but they never stopped. We just physically haven't been able to. We made a decision not to go out there and do that. But it's a, it's a scary time right now. And I don't want our I don't want your show to end up being a scary show. You know, you and I aren't scary guys, uh, but – people need to know that there are things out there um, whether you believe it just you know if you stick your head in the sand and choose to not believe doesn't mean that it doesn't exist and the devil's greatest accomplishment was to uh, make everybody believe that he doesn't exist some of us know all too well and all too real that he is very real and uh, so yeah, so that's uh, that's my life as uh, an ordained exorcist. It's a quiet life, <laughs> for the most part. Uh, but having said that, you know, even though me and Sharon aren't physically going out and working cases, we still get the paranormal drive-bys here, which are like a red mm-hmm. flag. They let me know that the phone's about to ring, and I have a, the next 24, 48 hours, I'm going to get a a case come across my desk because of the activity that we're sensing. Because the activity, when the demonic are around, is much different than the, the ghosts I have here, the resonant spirits I have here, or the spirits that are in visitation. Uh, it's a much different type of um, paranormal activity. And then I recognize it for what it is, and it kind of lets me know, oh, I must, and the phone's about to ring the next day or two, because somebody's going to reach out for help, and these whatever these disgusting things are, are kind of letting me know um, something's coming and uh, they're watching and they're always around. So you got to, um, you got to keep your camp clean. There's a valuable service that you're still able to uh, provide e- even with all the, uh, virus things going on. It's, it's had had to adapt a little bit. 
Absolutely. Okay. Sure. It'll all it'll all work out. It, it, there's yeah. a reason. Everything happens for a reason. I became a much better counselor. I was able to mm-hmm. learn how to empower people more, and I've been so proud of some of my clients for buying into what I was telling them they needed to do, and just to watch them dig deep and find the strength to fight back and accomplish that and bring closure to their own issue uh, was almost a greater reward for me than if I had been there physically. And um, so, uh, you know, those things, they work out, you know, everything happens for a reason, but I think we're going to be back uh, at it hot and heavy uh, next year when, when the COVID and the pandemic calms down a bit. I hope so. Uh, the, the, I think everyone really wants this thing to be over with. It, it, it's just been uh, very disruptive. But um, you know, with your uh, you know the training you've had and uh, to be an exorcist. Um, I don't know, we'll have to uh, be familiar with the Bible, and um, you know, yeah, there are some pretty creepy scenes in the Bible. Uh, it's uh, what t- sets the stage for you know, two thousand years later when Shaun of the Dead and Night of the Living Dead w- were released. Um. Yeah, you know, there's in uh, Mark chapter five. There's that. It, it's kind of like a zombie-like character that lives in this uh, graveyard, and they try to, you know, the vi- villagers try to keep them chained uh, th- there. Uh, but he is, you know, ha- has these. He- superhuman strengths and uh, breaks free and uh, runs around the uh, countryside uh, howling and uh, what is the uh, throwing stones at the village or just uh, making a, a a terrifying scene. Um, Sean, we get uh, some of these characters. Uh, I don't. I don't know what you really, uh, what you call them. It's, it kind of sounds part zombie-like. Uh, um, you, you know, with your training, it, do, do you have an understanding of what the biblical author? What was trying to convey about this character in that passage? Well, what I what I'm taking from that passage, and uh, I'm always the first to tell people that I'm admittingly not as Bible learned as I wish I was. I do I do uh, tell people all the time that I, I'm not a demonologist. I don't really study uh, demons. I much rather know and be more familiar with the one that I serve. I have one of the greatest collections of Bibles you can imagine. And I haven't cracked one open and just read the Bible in a long time, although I do a fair share of bibliomancy just for my own self. I mean, if I find myself... um, in a dilemma, a spiritual dilemma, and I need some advice, and I seem to be kind of caught between a rock and a hard spot and don't know which way to go, what to say, what to think, I will, you know, hold my favorite Bible, which has been in my family since before I was born. Oh. And I, I drop into a little bit of a meditative state, and uh, I ask for help for a particular intention, 
And I'll just open the Bible to wherever it happens to open up to, put my finger down to wherever my finger happens to land on whatever page. And 99.9% of the time, the passage that I will end up putting my finger on will give me that answer. I am not a theologian, and I know the last time I jumped in to the deep end, feet first, and started trying to, you know, quote scripture and um, uh, diagnose, uh, you know, give my put my two cents in on scripture. I remember the, it was this one show, and the whole following week I had one call after another, the one theologian after another, theologian after another, calling me to want to, you know, debate, talk, discuss, which was which was cool. Um, but I found, to me at least, a lot of these passages, it's all the same thing. It all comes down to testifying to the glory and the power of God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit and the Holy Family. Now, this man up in the hills, you can imagine before Jesus came, uh, demons and there is a term that we're some people in my field are throwing around called complete integration. And we do believe that in some instances, a person can be, first it starts with the infestation. Everybody's heard all of these and the, the oppression, God forbid, possession. And I wake up every morning and pray that I never have to take authority over or assist in another uh, possession case the rest of my life because they're very ugly, not fun at all. Um, they always take a piece of you with them, and you change a little bit every time. So I'm not only pray that prayer every day I wake up, but these demons ran amok. And we believe that in some possession cases, the possession can go on long enough to where the invading unclean spirit eventually extinguishes the soul and the life force of the original inhabitant of that body and pushes them out. And now what you have is the demon taking over that, completely taking over that body and walking around like a regular walking, talking, breathing human being, but it's not what you think. And then you see every day some of the horrific things that some people do that there's just no motive, no rhyme, no reason why they did such a horrific thing. And that's a lot of those circumstances, I believe, could could be complete integration, complete demonic integration. And that's a scary thing. And I think a lot of that happened back before Jesus was here. So now you have the Son of God who in essence is God in the human form, God the man, walking around. And when he came upon these demons, they were just like, oh, the gig's up. Um, and that's why I think they had the – you read some of these reactions in there that these demons had because this was, this was something different. The gig was up. Uh, here was this, they knew they knew their day was numbered, and now it had come to fruition that here is the uh, God, the man here that's going to cast me out, or send me into a pig, or uh, exercise me and cast me into the the endless fiery pit of lava. So, and then I believe some of these demons they're much lower level. And then they have to answer. I, it still makes me cringe to this day when you hear somebody say, I would rather rule in hell than serve in heaven. Oh, my gosh. I cringe. And I just got the goosebumps and the chills right now even saying that myself because you just don't know. Um, my wife and I are both. Uh, survivors of extreme demonic attacks. We're lucky to still be here, and the only reason why we are both still here is because of extreme divine intervention. And so whether you believe me or not or think I'm crazy or not, and that's okay if you do, I could be. 
That's why probably once every six, eight weeks, I sit down and talk with a psychiatrist. And every couple of months, I talk to a psychologist to make sure that, you know, I'm not crazy because the last thing you want, if you need help from someone like me, is to have a crazy exorcist in your home. So having said that, I believe that that's what the that's what you read a lot in, in the Bible. And the Bible is a very supernatural book. Um, mm-hmm. Scary, supernatural, paranormal, preternatural. You know, it's all in there, and uh, it freaks a lot of people out. But I think demons were just running them up before Jesus, before God sent Jesus down here, and that's why He sent. Them. We were we were damned, uh, and that's why. Jesus was sent down here uh, to save us. And so that's what I think you see in a lot of the, that's the reaction you see from a lot of these demons when they're confronted by Jesus Christ. And before they're confronted by him, when you hear of descriptions of them in the Bible as to how they're behaving and how they, the townspeople or nearby villagers are treating this person, um, it's because they they didn't they knew what was coming, but they hadn't yet come face to face with um, with Jesus. Well, and, and, and you just mentioned um, so zombies. I'm sorry the, to interrupt uh, you, but you mentioned zombies, and I believe yeah. a lot of these people that's a, a form of a zombie when you have. A complete integration, demonic integration, um, and it's different. It's different than possession. Um, yeah, I I wasn't sure what that character uh, was meant to symbolize. Uh, then in in Matthew chapter eight, you have the famous uh, pig scene, and that. That was the, the complete integration. Seems like you know, that might take uh, a passage of time to happen. But with the pig scene, that seemed to be a uh, sudden uh, removal of. Uh, demons and putting them into the pigs, and you know, it, it's um, also depicted in uh, the Sistine Chapel. Uh, it's on one of the walls. It, it's um, not. It, it, it was uh, done before Michelangelo did hit the, the ceiling in the uh, la, um, uh, the uh, uh, final judgment. The the, the one behind the uh, Altar, uh, but it, it, it's also depicted in the uh, Sistine Chapel. It, it, it that one seems a little. You know, you, you called the first one a complete integration. I, the the pig uh, pigs jumping off the cliff. I, that was a little bit more like a, a sudden integration. Uh, I don't know what you call well, it. Well, see, Jesus, um, I, I, Jesus had different power than right. than anyone else had. Even he gave the the authority and the power to all his apostles to cast out demons, but they didn't have Jesus's power. Jesus could do whatever he wanted to do, but that just goes to show you how disgusting these creatures are. They would rather, if you're going to cast us out, Jesus, send us into the pigs rather than throw us down to hell. Um, throw us into the pigs, and then um, the rest is history. But I, what I take from that passage is that's just, um, uh, to me, it, it to me, it's um, talking to me about how disgusting these things are, and that they would rather have Jesus. Uh, if you're going to cast us out, send us into the pigs. Um, but his power, one situation after another in the Bible, you hear about him doing things that are just um, 
just awe-inspiring, just, you know, unbelievable. Unless you're you're there. uh, uh, We can go from uh, the uh, pigs to uh, walking on water, uh, calming the storm, then, you know, walking out to the uh, boat. Um, yeah, that uh, that uh, freaked out Peter. That's another uh, supernatural uh, scene from the Bible. Uh, it, it, it's really very interesting to get your take on these well, passages. Well, it's funny that you bring up... Uh pigs and I hear about that more and more and it's like one of my probably most dramatic uh, I don't think I've ever actually seen a demon as he really looks or as it really looks they always appear to be something else and many times a lot of people want to know uh, I've had many people witness what I do when I arrive at a demonic an extremely demonically infested location where it can also be infested and everybody's oppressed and you have someone uh, possessed in there, maybe not possessed, just an extremely infested location. And I don't enter the home without dropping on my knees, saying some special prayers first at the front door. And then my two main weapons that I use are humility and love. So I can't think of anything more humble than to crawl on your hands and knees. So I do that over the threshold. And many times in the act of doing that, everybody can hear what sounds like, for lack of a better description, a herd of pigs squealing and screaming and running out of the house. And sometimes that's all it takes and everything's over with. And you can feel that it's over at that moment. But if it's not over at that moment, usually the second thing I do is I line everybody up on the living room couch and I bring out a big bowl of holy water and I wash everybody's feet in holy water, which was something Jesus did to his apostles a lot. And Uh that's the second most powerful, humbling thing I can think to do. Then sometimes you have the same reaction while I'm doing that, and you hear the the herd of pigs. But I've had demons appear to me as family members. Like they'll be in one end of the house, I won't know it, and I'll walk actually into one of the family members thinking it's a family member and then realize, no, I'm not in the presence of the family member. And on one instance I had one transform into what looked like probably a mix of like a feral pig, feral cat type looking thing that ran at me and then ended up running down a hallway into a bedroom and out a two story window. So it's uh-huh. funny that you bring up the word pigs because it's um uh it's just uh, it just seems to be like a recurring a recurring thing on these uh, uh, at least the cases that I work and um, so it's it's interesting that you bring that up. Well, it, I just have to, have, have to wonder about uh, from what the first. Uh, century A.D. when the uh, examples from um, Mark and Matthew were uh, written up until you know, in the last few, few years when you were just describing it, it, it just seems like there's uh, some kind of con- continuity uh over about a two thousand year period um, in the documentation um yeah you know, you know, just fascinated by some of these patterns that um 
really don't change over time. They, they just seem st- uh, established. And this is you know, what we have to deal with. You know, kind, of, kind of like the everything happens at midnight. You know, like They're just really not uh, – in a lot of these stories, you, you just really don't feel like uh, there's a passage of time. Everything is just – happens at midnight and it's just slow motion it's it, it, it's really in, interesting how that concepts like that haven't changed over millennia and they're also uh, uh, you know like the angel that um, frees Peter from the Roman prison uh, it's it's not a scary. Uh, it's, it's not intended to be a, a creepy scene, but yeah, you know, the angel is. Uh, sounds like it's kind of depicted as almost being a bioluminescent uh, being. Um, that, that that would be awe inspiring, not necessarily terrifying but yeah there's you know really a lot of really uh interesting characters in in the bible that uh is uh, really make you wonder you know are they uh, you know the authors of the bible uh aware of what we're uh uh, learning about with all these EVPs or you know all the new uh, gadgets that are uh, you know revealing uh, the presence of these uh, beings. I think in many I think in many circumstances, and this only just is because I was just your typical paranormal investigator slash ghostbuster for many, many years before becoming ordained. I think many of these are tricksters and what you think you're getting isn't exactly what you're getting. So you have to be careful. A lot of my clients that come to me are uh, the next generation ghost hunters haven't been doing it very long. It started as a hobby. They thought it'd be a really cool thing. Don't really know what they're doing. Found themselves at the wrong place at the wrong time, doing the wrong thing. Ended up with an attachment. And now they're calling me to help them with that. So um, just want, you know, if if anybody takes anything from this uh, show tonight is to just be careful. These things are very real. Nobody, there's no experts. Nobody has all the answers. I think all these gadgets that you would would, would put it are ex- exactly that, just gadgets. And um, more of, more times than not, these things are up to no good, and will hurt you. And so you have to be very very careful. A warning that you just gave the listeners. Um, There is kind of a lengthy passage in uh, the book of Ephesians about putting on God's armor. Um, Even with... um, or, uh, earlier books like uh, uh, I, don't, I don't have the uh, book in front of me. Um, what's it called? The uh, Bhagavad Gita. Um, yeah, that that book opens up with a uh, on a battlefield. Oh, you know, since, since you're dealing with. Um, you know, these uh, 
good and bad forces is that do you really think that's uh, an aspect of life that everyone needs to be aware of and you know, how do how should we arm ourselves with um, you know God's armor well me being baptized Catholic, I was ordained through a Christian university, but being a baptized Catholic, of course, that's the angle I come from. And that's one of the things that I will first and foremost bring up to clients is that's that's what I'm about. And that's the angle I'm going to come at here uh, in dealing with this. And I don't want to, I'm not trying to convert anybody over to Catholicism or Christianity, but they need to know where I'm coming from. And so we can get it out of the way right from the beginning. And if they're not comfortable with that, then uh, I can totally understand, and I will do my darndest to try and find somebody that's more suited and a better fit to, for them to help them. But for me, um, it's just an everyday thing, and it's it's a lifelong thing. Like for me, it's been a lifelong thing, not only from baptism, but then many years later when you go into manhood, there's – the Catholic religion has confirmation, which is like the bat mitzvah in the Jewish religion, and we get confirmed. And um, then my story goes, like I said, my story goes back probably to before I was born, and I think all of this was already in the cards and on the books and uh, meant to happen the way it happened and the path that I'm on now. Um, I think this was already planned out way back once upon a time. But for me, it's like you have to try your best to stay as much in a state of grace as you can. Am I a saint? No. Do I still sin? Yes. But you have to try to stay as much in a state of grace as possible. So, and it's been tough this year with the COVID, but mm-hmm. when before the pandemic and the lockdown, you have to try to go to confession as often as possible, go to mass, and receive communion as much as possible. And when I'm really, really dealing with something extremely ugly and malevolent and disgusting, um, power of prayer and faith um, – that's part of the armor. Hollowed ground is also not yeah. discussed enough. If you can get a person who's so oppressed that they're about to be possessed or possessed or even complete integration, uh, but maybe there's a, you sense there's, there's a little bit left of some, of some essence of that person that was there before fighting to get, get, get back you got to get them on hallowed ground, and if you can't get them on hallowed ground, you have to know how to make the ground that you're at hallowed. So you, many times before the exorcism even takes place, you have, there has to be an exorcism of the property in the home if you can't get this person to a church. And um, I, it, just about every day I recommend baptism to somebody. Now, if you're not Catholic, or even if you want to become Catholic, you can't just run to the church and get baptized. There's a few years involved in their catechism and some other things that take place. So I recommend either a Christian-based church that does baptisms or even a non-denominational um, Christian-based church that does complete submersion in the holy waters and get there and make an appointment to get baptized that goes a long, long way um, in your suit, putting your suit of armor together and wearing the armor. And then continue to attend uh, uh, services. And, it's, you know, if, you, if you've been targeted, a lot of people disagree with me on this. And many clients take this as an insult when I say this to them, but more times than not, if you are being targeted by these things, 
you have knowingly or unknowingly or someone in your family has knowingly or unknowingly done something to give this thing the feeling that it's been given permission and invited to come in and attach. And it, it, who knows what that, what that could be. And it could be anything from alcohol abuse to drug abuse to um, uh, anything. Uh, uh, the husband cheating on his wife, the wife cheating on his husband. Many, and I'm going to get hate mail for this, but many single women in this town especially come to me for help who are either prostitutes or work at a brothel or they're a stripper, um, and there's also drug abuse. You've got to change all that stuff in your life. And a lot of times these people aren't willing, ready, and able to make this kind of adjustment. They want the torment to stop. Whatever this is that's attached to them, they want gone. But I don't know if it's a matter of they just haven't hit rock bottom yet or if I lack something in my technique of trying to convince them this is what you need to do. I'm, I usually write it off as they're just not ready yet because usually if somebody comes to me and they're really, really ready, they make the change. And that goes a long way in bringing closure to these cases. And nobody's more heartbroken than me when I'm not able to bring closure to a case. And I take the brunt of that. I'm harder on myself than anybody. Um, and I, I feel that there's something lacking in my approach and in how I've treated this person and handled this person uh, that I wasn't able to get them to uh, buy in and make the changes that are needed. So the armor of God, I love that term, and it's not just one thing. It's a lot of things. And for me, it's been something that uh, a series of things over many, many years, starting from when I was baptized. Okay. When you were just talking about some people who may uh, feel that they're ready to get out of uh, destructive lifestyles. Um, do, do you hear, you know, maybe, you know, later on as, you know, people were uh, recovering, uh, have moved on to um, the lifestyle that they want for themselves and you know, made the change. And do you get reports about uh, they see or sense uh, guardian angels uh, keeping them on the right road? Uh, it happens a lot. I get into that discussion with people really? a lot because they know that I'm a big believer. Anybody that's done any research on me at all knows that I'm a big believer in the guardian angel thing. And uh, I believe I've seen and met mine twice, uh, probably on a couple of other occasions had this angel save my life on more than one occasion, at least four that I can think of, two that I saw her, two that I heard her, and a lot of people come to me and want to know that. They'll, most of them want to know, say, I just experienced this. What do you think that was? Is it a family spirit in visitation watching over me? Uh, did I accidentally conjure up an ancestor? Is it a spirit guide, a guardian angel? What do you think? I get that a lot. But one thing I left out on the on getting, you know, changing things up, if you find yourself targeted by uh, something extremely malevolent is just w sometimes people are doing something that falls under the umbrella of witchcraft or the or the dark arts or the occult and they don't even realize it. So you got to just be very careful what you do. And uh, I am a big big believer and fan of guardian angels for sure. How about you? Um. I'm, I'm... I'm not sure if I've 
you know, really had an experience where um, I could attribute something to a guardian angel, um, maybe a, a situation I had with uh, I kind of attribute it to uh, my grandmother's influence from beyond. I, uh, maybe I, I, I should uh, re-evaluate that as uh, a guardian angel. Um, you know, urging me to uh, be in contact with uh, my mom. I, don't, I, I that that may be I ne, uh, never saw a, a face with it or you know presence or anything like that. I just uh, uh, wasn't sure how I wasn't sure uh, to whom t- uh, to attribute that connection. Um. So I I don't. I don't know. I, I didn't have it, it. It may not be as uh, for me. It may not be as clearly defined as what you know. The couple examples that you, you the personal examples that you uh, discussed. I'm not. I'm just. I, I'm not sure. It, it, but I do believe. Uh, you know, like that. Uh, um, like after the. Uh, where Jesus um, uh, faced you know the devil and uh, you know the wilderness, and he, he eventually uh, Satan eventually went away. Uh, you know the uh, guardian angels came to to uh, uh, Jesus, and you know, yeah, just, yeah, just kind of. You know, uh, I, I don't know, like debrief him after the, the uh, encounter. Um, I, I believe that's uh, very po- uh, uh, I think uh, what was documented there. Uh, you know, I think it's very plausible that happened. Um, yeah. Yeah. You also, you also had that other example from. Uh, you know, when uh, is it Daniel or uh, it's in the book of Daniel that uh, Meshach and you know the couple other guys that were thrown into the uh, furnace and there was uh, when uh, who, who's it the king looked into the furnace there was a fourth person in there but they only threw mm-hmm. three people in there. Uh, how, how do you yeah. how, how how do you explain that help person there uh, helping to f- uh, fan the flames away from uh, the three people in the furnace and uh, you know keep keep them uh, safe during that uh, time period and. Uh, it's, in, it's also in uh, T. S. Eliot's uh, oh, *Wasteland*. He 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 has a um, I think a couple characters walking uh, t- to a church, and they talk about uh, there was just you and me, but uh, where the third person? There, there was a third person attend. Uh, felt like they were with us. Are like so halfway many, through so the people, poem, but um, yeah, there's like that that uh, it's like third man factor uh, uh, where these like angels uh, help someone off uh, like Mount Everest. You know, it's like dark and blo- you know they can't find uh, you know their way down a really steep part of the mountain, and you know these mountain climbers you know, report. I you know, it's, it's, I heard this voice tell me, you know, just go 
a hundred feet to the left and, you know, there'll be safety there. Uh, and you know, the storm, uh, you know, you know, will blow over and you'll be okay. And, you know, they made it down the next day. How, how, how do you explain th- these, um, characters that show up to do good things in your life? It's, it's um, like I said, I'm a big, big believer mm-hmm. in uh, guardian angels. And uh, I always tell people that's one of the four big prayers that I tell people. I mean, even if you want to download them and tape them to your refrigerator or pin them to a bulletin board or thumbtack them to the wall next to your bed, I always tell people at least once a day, if not when you wake up and before you go to bed, if you want to say an Our Father, a Hail Mary, prayer to St. Michael, short version in English, and make sure you add in a prayer to your guardian angel. And I can't stress oh. how important that is. Imagine what kind of job that is. Can you imagine how many people make their guardian angel work overtime for uh, for no extra time and a half? Can you imagine? Sometimes I think about when I'm, you know, my younger days when I was a lot wilder and crazier. I mean, my wife met me 18 years ago. I was a raging alcoholic and drug abuser. And I was, you know, I had some crazy, crazy years when I was younger. And I know that my guardian angel was was working overtime. And so now when I'm a very careful person and and I try to be the very best version of myself as I can be every day, try to be a better version of myself tomorrow than I am right now talking to you, I think of my guardian angel and if, if I'm able to accomplish that, I make their existence that's much easier. I'd like to think of my guardian angel just kicking back on a lounge chair, you know, um, drinking his favorite drink that's made for him by Jesus and having a, a good laugh about how stupid I am. But now that I've come around and I don't have to, he doesn't have to work so hard to watch me anymore. But you can down, you can go online and type in prayers to guardian angels, and oh my gosh, hundreds and hundreds of them. And you just start reading. It's almost like the very first one you read might be the one that you fall in love with. But just read them, and you know, pick a few. And they're they're usually all so beautiful. And just don't. uh, You should pray more to your guardian angel. Big big fan. And like I said, I've. Seen mine twice, both times she saved my life. And then the two Mm -hmm. times I just heard her were also life-saving instances in my life, Uh, incidents that were, that had I not had that help, I'm I'm absolutely positive I wouldn't be here right now. So now you can just imagine back back in the day, man, you know, angels. That would would be a pretty, uh, it'd be a pretty awesome, awe-inspiring, fr- frightening. Any any term you want to throw at me, something it, they'll all stick on the wall. Throw it all at the wall. It'll all stick. Any emotion you can imagine, you're going to experience if you actually saw your guardian angel. And and I've felt all of that. So um, you can you can just imagine, and I do think there's levels of them. I think that maybe, I think that maybe some of us all, to a certain degree, uh, do our fair share of of coming back and being and watching over loved ones, uh, trying to to give guidance and protection, and as much as we're able to do from the other side of the veil do whatever we can in in the vein of, of of a guardian angel but without actually being a guardian angel. And, and there's nothing wrong with when someone passes, you always hear someone saying an angel just got his wings. It's okay to say that, but I do believe there's mm-hmm. a difference between um, you coming back uh, as a spirit guide or uh, – in visitation or even, you know, to just watch over some loved ones 
if uh, if you're called upon, if if, you're, if that's needed and you're called upon to do that, but I do believe there's a difference between that and an actual guardian angel. Uh, you don't have the kind of power that the guardian angels have, even in the spirit world. So um, that's uh, that's my take on it. I, <laughs> I know you and I had this discussion once back uh you know some time back and you got a uh, you you kind of uh like had a good laugh over me describing my guardian angel to you and uh I told you not to feel bad everybody does laugh and for everyone mm-hmm. that's listening that doesn't know mine looks just like a young Susan Sarandon from like early rocky horror picture times and that's the god's honest truth and when I was still like in junior high school, I was swimming at the beach. I lived in Southern California at the time and I was actually drowning in the ocean and I was stuck in a riptide and I was about to go down for the third time. And they say, you go down the third time, you're done. And I heard a voice say, swim this way. And I looked over and here's this head of a girl bobbing up and down in the water. All I could see was her head. I assumed it was just, she's dog paddling. She says, swim this way. So a matter of factly, so I swam that way, and it got me right out of the riptide. The waters were all of a sudden very calm. I had this, like, renewed strength to continue to just to swim on in to shore. And when I got there, there was a lifeguard waiting for me. And uh, he said, you know, you look like you were struggling a little bit out there. I almost jumped in and came out there, but then you looked like you were okay and, and going to be okay, so... Everything okay? I said, yeah, but uh, I got some help from that girl. And he said, what girl? And I looked back out there, and it was late in the day. There was no one around. There was no girl out there. And he said, no, I didn't see anybody out there with you. And that was the first one. And then now, many, many years later, um, I'm trying to drive home, you know, probably a, an hour's drive from this party I had gone to, and I'd had way too much to drink. And some guys tried to take my keys from me. And they weren't able to do it, and I ended up getting in my truck and driving home. But I was, uh, according to the police report, (laughs) I was about to get pulled over because I was swerving so bad on the freeway. But before the highway patrol man actually lit me up and tried to pull me over, I must have fallen asleep at the wheel. And I had turned my, sharply turned my truck to the right, and I was heading off a cliff and what woke me up was this girl yelling wake up loud screaming in my right ear and I looked up and it's that same girl I saw in the water sitting Hmm. in my passenger seat in my truck and that woke me up and got me to look straight ahead I saw the cliff coming and I cranked my wheel back to the left fishtailed just short of the cliff and then drove completely across the other side, all the lanes and smashed head on into the center divider, which was concrete. I actually flipped end over end onto the other side of the freeway and I was out for a few days. But when, but I went and saw my truck later and like the engine was in the seat where I was sitting and the the roof was down on top of the engine. There was no, how I got out of there, I don't know, and I only ended up with a broken wrist. So, um, their guardian angels are very, very real. Um, and she came to my aid again during an extreme demonic attack that I had uh, working a case. That was so fr- the, the attack was so frightening. I actually left the field for a while. I hadn't become ordained yet, but I was training. And I actually uh, had said enough's enough. This is too much for me. And I walked away from the field for about a year until a pastor friend of mine was working a paranormal case. She begged me to help her on this case. And I said no to her two or three times to finally, I couldn't come up with another excuse why I wasn't going to go help her. And I went on this case and then I had a vision of the Holy Spirit there. And so it was all meant to be. All the cards fell into place. I knew that I was meant to work this case and have that vision, which let me know uh-huh. that God always had my back and there was no reason for me to doubt or fear or walk away from the path I was supposed to be on. 
And I'm glad I, I jumped back on the horse because the very next case after that was a very, very ugly possession case. And I was the only one available to this family to come in there and take authority over the exorcism. And um, had I not had I not met that family, um, that case was was very ugly. I don't think that young man would have would have survived that. So everything, I mean, it's hard for some people to wrap their their head around, but it's amazing how you experience things and you look back at it and you're able mm-hmm. to like almost connect the dots and say, if I hadn't been there, this wouldn't have happened. And if that didn't happen, it wouldn't have led me that way. And if I didn't go that way, I wouldn't have ended up accomplishing this. And it's just, uh, you just, you know, people, you hear the, the term thrown around loosely all the time. Well, that was meant to be, and it was already in the cards. It was already, uh, that, this has already all been planned ahead of time. And it's hard to wrap your head around that, but I truly now, at 60 years of age, and I'll be 61 in November, I look back uh, over my life and I realize this was all in planned out before I was even born to have me right here on this path uh, doing what I'm doing today. And so when you, when you think about it, it's pretty sobering. Um, and people are one probably wondering out there, so do you still drink and take drugs? My wife was, after a severe demonic attack on her during the case, um, we fought that demon off. It took about eight weeks. It came home with us, and it was in her house with us. We fought that off. She was the target, the main target. But when we finally got closure to that situation, it left her with three very rare forms of cancer. And she doesn't drink, doesn't smoke, no history of cancer in her family. Um, the insidiousness of this cancers that she got, they were so rare. And the way they attacked her, it was so obvious that it was from this demonic attack that um, uh, I had to take some more time off and decide that, you know, uh, doctors said she's not going to survive this. But divine intervention, man, you know, I uh, one night when I thought she was absolutely – going to be dead in bed next to me in the morning, I snuck off and went to this all-night prayer chapel around the corner from us, and I crawled on my hands and knees from the front door all the way to the altar and threw myself um, to the, you know, the mercy of God and onto that altar and begged for her life and um, completely turned around um, last set of uh, full body MRI that we've done and other tests show no metastasis of any of the diseases left in her That's body good. and they're all gone now and she's still with us so it's it's a very I'm telling you oh anyway long story short I also knew that I couldn't take care of her still doing drugs and drinking so I just asked God one day I said you know that I know that you exist and you know that I love you and you know that you know, whatever you want from me, I'm yours. But I really need you to intervene in my life right now and stop me from taking any more drugs and drinking. And if you're really all that powerful, and I know you are, and you know I know you are, I don't want to take another drink or take any more drugs of any kind ever again. And I never even gave it another thought. And it was it was weeks later, and I just realized I'm going through life, and I'm so happy and feeling so great, and what was the difference? I said, oh, my gosh, I can't remember the last time I had a drink. Um, and it's been years now, so no desire for any uh, any drugs, any drinking, nothing. And it all comes down to faith and the power of prayer and your faith and asking. you got to ask. You ask on your knees for God or Jesus to intervene in your life at that moment that you need him to intervene in your life right then and express verbally as if he's standing in front of you what you need him to do for you. But uh, don't be ungrateful. If you're given a gift like that, don't be ungrateful. Don't, you know, the next, you know, make life easy on your guardian angel. If you're, if you are a a witness of a recipient 
of extreme divine intervention. Pay it forward. Make them proud of you as to the person you're going to become from that instant, in, from, from experiencing that. Um, show them that. Uh, compliment them back. Pay it forward and be a better person because they, they helped you. You asked for them to intervene in your life and help you with something. They did it. You know it was a miracle. Pay it forward. Change. Okay, Sean, with your several examples of uh, good things coming from bad events, uh, what you said about uh, pay it forward, um, uh, well, if we you know, kind, of, kind of stick with, uh, you know, one of the concepts behind the show. Um, if we look at, uh, say, you know, the the uh, book or uh, movie, uh, Pet Cemetery. Um, we can even look at, uh, you know, The sh- Shining uh, as well. Um, you know, those uh, books are great at uh terrifying uh you know the reader uh but Stephen King is also writing uh, to make us a- aware of um uh, issues like um in pet cemetery uh was it G- gage's mom when she was little uh it was sitting with her uh, disabled older sister and it, uh, I, I, uh, I believe she she died on her, her younger sister's watch. Uh, it, you know, it haunted her throughout uh, the book and, you know, as, you know, when she became the mom, you know, she's dealing with uh, uh, her son's death. You know, so the you know role was kind of reversed. Uh, you know, you know, Steve, Stephen King is asking us to you know step into the roles of a traumatized uh, uh, child. It, um, I, I think. Uh, a lot of um, books that people might be reading at this time of the year, um, yeah, uh, yeah, do ask us to look at uh, some of the darker places that uh, people may find themselves at some point, or uh, see the struggles uh, someone is, a neighbor is going through. Um, yeah, you know, you're also also working with um, some vets with uh, PTSD, and you know, you're also talking about um, some of the uh, people when who were you know, like the strippers and. Uh, uh, yeah, there might be a correlation there between early an early childhood tra- traumatic event and why they're on the pole. Um, but how how are uh, you know you able to help some of the uh, vets to get through? these uh, uh, difficult uh, periods now that they're uh, coming back from you know, these uh, foreign wars? 
Well, it's it's close to my heart for many, many reasons. Um, mm-hmm. One, because my father was a 25-year retired Master Chief radio man, um, naval intelligence from the United States Navy, fought in World War II, Korea, Purple Heart recipient. And, you know, he always seemed like a pretty normal cat to me my whole life growing up. He's, you know, one of my heroes. I, I miss him dearly. He's in heaven now. Dad, rest in peace. But I remember late in life, um, probably a couple of years before we lost him, and he started having some medical issues and went in for some procedures and stuff. And whenever they gave him any, he was coming up out of anesthesia, man, he would be having these, uh, like he was back in some situation in the war, um, uh, pretty traumatizing, traumatic, whatever it was he was going through. But then you think about a lot of these guys that come back. Now, I'm not a doctor. I, don't, I, I couldn't prescribe medicine, and I know a lot of it is handled with medicine, which is a shame. But um, that's uh, vet suicide's off the charts right now. So um, I know I have a Sunday show, and one of my producers, WO Entertainment, it's all about it's all vets that run that network, and they're all they do a lot of events and have a lot of shows that any type of proceeds that they're able to pull in from these events all go to um, the prevention of vet suicide. I know the president just passed a bill into law last week, I think it was, called the Prevention the Suicide uh, Gra- uh, Veterans Mental Health and Suicide Prevention Bill, um, which is going to be a great thing. But you talk about uh-huh. PTSD. Even like in the cases, my demonic cases, I – call it PTDD, post-traumatic demonic distress syndrome. Once you go through something like that, it's with them the rest of their life. Me, Mm -hmm. it just seems to be, I never lose contact with my clients who I've helped through a situation like that. And that's all they need to know is that that they still have that support group and someone to talk to. Um, And whatever it is they get out of uh, talking to you when they need to talk to you, uh, is uh, invaluable. And so those guys, the vets, um, so often you hear the horror stories about how they're, you know, uh, just forgotten. And it's just a shame because, mm-hmm. and I did I did a tour in the Navy also. And I know that if, um, you know, if I really needed some help and couldn't find it and seemed like my country had turned its back on me after, you know, fighting for it, it would be that alone might be uh, distressing enough to uh, send you in a very dark direction. So it's just all, you know, I'm not a, yeah, I've read books, you know, uh, it's hard sometimes. I, I treat a lot of people. I go to a lot of cases where I know the client probably has schizophrenia or something like that. But it doesn't mean that they're still not suffering some type of mm-hmm. malevolent attachment. And what they're telling me they're experiencing is true. I believe a lot of people in that have been committed to psychiatric hospitals might not be crazy at all and could be experiencing legitimate demonic attachment. And then they just get drugged up and stuck away and forgotten. And it's just um, a sad reality. But, yeah, that's close to my heart, all of that, the the vets and vet suicide mm-hmm. and PTSD. And um, and it comes in so many, so many forms. You know, it's like there's a lot of guys, even in my neighborhood here, the 4th of July is brutal on some of my neighbors here because they're vets. Um, mm-hmm. and, and the firecrackers. Uh, yeah, they spend, it's even worse than, uh, the dogs breaking loose from the backyards and because they can't handle it and the animal control <laughs> clinics and other animal hospitals around their clinics are overflowing uh, the morning after or two days after the 4th of July because of all the animals that, you know, ran free, got out of the yards because they're so freaked out. You know, these many of these guys spend their 4th of July under a coffee table. Uh, so it's just, 
it's just sad. I wish I could do more, but I know at the very the very least what I could do, which seems to be a lot of help, is just to be there for him and you know listen mm-hmm. and um, be a buddy, you know, and, and and do what you can just to uh, listen and be there for him. I mean, you know, if I could do more, I wish I could, but. Um, Sometimes that's all they need, and and I'm, I'm all about that. Okay, dude. No, I. I well, while we were um, talking about some ideas, you know, like you know, which you know, kind of scary. Uh, books or whatever to talk about, you know, for uh, a Halloweenish type type show. Yeah, um, I did ask you about, you know, what what do you think the that creature is on in the Fuseli painting where in you know, the Ladies laying across the bed, and I think she has like one in the back of her hand on her forehead, and there's this like little um, like demon type creature sitting on her chest. Um, and I think the painting was done in like the 1780s. And I think there's like a horse head, a white horse head, you know, kind of almost like the you know, your opening uh, passage that you read to us um, at the start of the show, it, it, you know, it's, it's kind of, it, the horse head's kind of peering out uh, behind these uh, curtains around the bed. Um, I'm sure most uh, you know, listeners are familiar with that. But, you know, the artist seems to be uh, cognizant of something that um, may appear while we're asleep um, you know is uh, you know when we're asleep is that we're at our weakest moments how, you know, what are some of your thoughts of supernatural portrayed in that painting? What you know, what what are some lessons we can learn from looking at that two hundred and fifty year old painting? It's it's funny you bring that painting up. But you, they usually use that painting as an example for quite a few things from uh, sleep paralysis uh, right. issues to uh, demonic possession issues to uh, a number of other things. That thing that's sitting on that girl is very gargoyle-ish, you know, and there's a, uh, you know, we can go down a completely yep. different road with the whole gargoyle thing. But I am experiencing a phenomena right now with the whole dream state thing and um uh, it's just very unusual i have several cases where everybody is telling me that they have these creatures coming to them when they're asleep some of these are very incubus succubus like you know some of the dreams are very sexual and very pleasant to extremely terrifying and painful to some of these beings seeming like they're interdimensional and they take these people in their dream state off through to other dimensions and show them things. So I don't know what I'm dealing with. I don't know if I'm dealing with the demonic, ghosts, possession, uh, ETs. It's um, it's pretty crazy. Now I have, uh, from time to time, have rid my own roller coaster of periods of my life where I've suffered from severe night terrors. And I used to just write them off as, well, you know, that's part of the game because of the things I've seen and I've experienced and the things I deal with. 
but the some of these phenomenon. night terror, yeah, some of these night terrors were uh, all too real and um, had per- seemed to have purpose behind them, not just some random freaky dream, uh, but seemed to have some some direction and some purpose to them. So um, it's quite a quite a phenomena. And uh, this whole sleep paralysis thing is uh, uh, is it's a scary thing, but some of it can be explained medically. And mm-hmm. uh, you get me in the room with a psychiatrist and a psychologist and a doctor and and me, and we're all going to have a different opinion um, about what's going on. And um, you know. One guy's going to say it can all be treated with medication. One's going to say it's all in the mind. One's going to have some names as to what these people are suffering through. Uh, I have a couple of books that I haven't cracked open and read in a long time. But um, these books have helped me to a certain degree. Now, I'm not an expert, and I do many times will tape interviews and then let my psychologist or my psycho- my psychiatrist friend listen to these interviews. Many times I'll confront people who I think could possibly be suffering from a mental illness, and lots of times they're not honest with me. I'll ask them in the intake form or the initial interview, have you or anybody in your immediate family or ancestry bloodline that you know of ever – had uh, been clinically diagnosed with a mental illness and or seen a doctor under the care of a physician and on any strong meds. And I have, sadly enough, been lied to a couple of times because nobody wants to admit to that. And then you find out later. Then you have to decide, do you want to be mad because they lied to you or do you want to just understand what an upsetting personal thing that was and now that it's out in the open, deal with it. And I guess it depends on what side of the bed I woke up on that morning. I don't like being lied to because um, I can't really help anybody unless they're totally honest with me. So um, the whole this whole sleep paralysis thing and the dreams things and some of these clients that I've been uh, approached with it's 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 crazy. The mind is such a such a um, amazing thing. And um, sometimes just determining if that's all I'm dealing with as opposed to to being uh, an actual malevolent case mm-hmm. is it can be tricky. So then I have to just sometimes just, you know, Sharon, my wife, and I both have what we commonly refer to all the time as spidey senses. More times than not, we just go on our own gut feelings and our own intuition and um, experience and discernment, we use that term a lot, discernment, to know if if we're dealing with uh, a legitimate uh, demonic case or something malevolent or just a ghost or or if the person is having some some mental illness. Now, if the person answers the question and says, yeah, I have been diagnosed with this and I have seen a doctor and I am on meds, but I swear to you, it's not that. What's really happening to me is really happening to me. Um, I believe them. Until I can prove that someone is uh, uh, trying to deceive me, I I believe you. And I do believe that a lot of people can still be experiencing something and have some and have mental illness at the same time. It's just it's really tricky. You're walking a tightrope there and you gotta be careful. Um but usually the sad thing is, usually if someone, if, if I'm able to determine that someone's honest with me, I have to do the appropriate thing, you know, and I have to uh, take a step back and uh, just tell them, this is my advice to you. Continue to see your doctor. Continue to stay on your meds. And everything you've talked to me about, just because he's not an exorcist or a paranormal investigator, share these things with, with your doctor, and uh, sometimes that goes, that talk goes well. Sometimes that talk doesn't go very well, and they get extremely mad at you. I'm always guilt. I'm always the one responsible for it all. Every time my phone rings and I pick it up and talk to somebody, 
if I can't come over there right then and wave a magic wand and make it all better, now I'm the bad guy. <laughs> so I got to deal with that all the time too, and that's okay. You know, I get off the phone, I say a prayer for strength and understanding, and continue to pray for that person, and just you, you just got to shake it off. You have to shake it off, or you can't do what I do. Okay, and. You, sure. You, you have had some experiences with uh, actors who, yeah, uh, furthered your interest in, uh, you know, just some of the um, mysteries of just being alive. Uh, uh, you, you've also met uh, Robert Duvall and you also met Dan Aykroyd. Where did you hear these stories? <laughs> uh, I, I, I watch did. your show. <laughs> I don't pay did. attention. I, uh, I, like it was yesterday. I, well, I was, a lot of people don't know this. And I, <laughs> in um, For about 10 years during the late seventies and all of the eighties, I was a very popular very successful street dancer in LA and that led uh, my crew got hired to perform at the rap party for Ghostbusters 2 and I actually had a much more interesting discussion with Bill Murray that night than I did with Dan Bill actually asked me to teach him how to dance and uh, he talked to me about I'm getting ready to get out of comedy I'm going to film a movie called Razor's Edge and it's a dramatic role I'm hoping that launches me in a completely different direction I love the movie. I thought he did a great job, but you know, uh, he's still a comedian. But I did talk to Dan some. Dan remembered me many, many years later when I went to go get um, uh, his father's book autographed by him, and then buy some of his. I actually ended up buying three bottles of his uh, vodka that he makes, and had him autograph the bottles. I haven't cracked him open. I understand his vodka is delicious. But he even remembered me after all those years as that guy, that street dancer that one time at that party that uh, talked with him. Very cool. But I remember going up to the bar to get a drink after we performed, and I had to fight my way through because it was probably like 10 people deep at this one bar, and you had to kind of fight your way up there to get a drink, and then you had to kind of almost manhandle the bartender uh, to get his attention and get, get your drink. And as I'm waiting for my drink to be poured, I just kind of look to my left. I go, oh, there's Sean Penn. I look to my right. Oh, there's Robert Duvall, two guys that I love. They were actually filming a movie called Colors at the time. And oh, wow. um, so I uh, talked a little bit with them. And, uh, yeah, I've had some great experiences. Uh, a couple of movies, a bunch of videos, a couple of TV shows, um, which led to another interesting job. There was um, uh, the producer for the uh, very popular show. Um, oh my gosh, I forget the name of it. Two brothers who were p- private investigators. Um, I forget the name of it. Uh, Gerald McRaney was one of the actors. I forget the name of the other guy. Good looking blonde dude. They were brothers and they were paranormal. Um, I'm sorry, just private investigators. Well, he had a, an organization trying to find runaways of the rich and famous down there in Hollywood. And at the time, you know, I was very well known on the streets down there. You know, I'm sporting a mohawk and dressing like MC Hammer and everybody knew me. I worked underground for this guy trying to find these runaways for the rich and famous down there because only, you know, down in that world, I couldn't do it today. And I'm probably, if it was like it is Today, back then, down there, I probably couldn't do the job. But I got down in there, and I've had some very extremely powerful paranormal experiences and demonic experiences during that time in my life, too, during that kind of work. And it's all in my book. Well, not all of it. I didn't want my book to be another war and peace, so I left a lot of stuff out of it. Maybe I'll write another one. But I think I did cover that in my book, that uh, time that I worked for that uh, uh, private investigative uh, company trying to find runaways. 
Very interesting so, uh, down there. They... So you, you, you've you done a lot of work to uh, reunite families and I- improve the quality of life for people. I never thought about it that way, but I guess you're right. And I've decided what I want for payment in return. You want to know what that is? Um, sure. I want to finally win Publishers Clearinghouse. Is that asking too much? My wife and I have been playing Publishers Clearinghouse. <sighs> I can't even tell you how many years. She has been long before she met me and me long before I met her, and we still continue to play together to this day. You think they would throw us a bone? Hopefully that will happen for you and Sharon. <laughs> Uh, I kid, but yeah, we do play that a lot. We think about all the things we would do, and it's funny. It's just the things that we would do, and it's you know now you know you're getting old because you're like, yeah, we could use some repairs to the roof, some siding mm-hmm. on the house, get it painted again, get a new car, um, uh, you know, it's all that kind of stuff. Let's not go buy a yacht and travel the world, um, uh, or that kind of thing, but. Um, I would like to do that, buy a ghost town, refurbish it up, reopen the church, and give services every Sunday at some really cool ghost town out in the middle of the desert, Um, buy a town, be the preacher, be the mayor, own the town, have a a bed and breakfast there and a saloon and and kind of run the town. And uh, my wife and I almost, when we first met, we almost bought a lighthouse. The government was selling lighthouses for a dollar at the time, and you could, but you had to prove that you could be a handyman and keep it up. Um, and that didn't work out. But uh, they have ghost towns for sale all the ta- time out here, out in the Mojave Desert. And uh, we thought about that, you know, just get out, you know, fly under the radar, under the grid, um, live our what's left of our wonderful journey now out in in the wild, wild west in some cool old ghost town with a ton of history and let paranormal investigators and UFO people come out there and do night watches and ghost hunts and but still, you know, run the town, you know, uh, as best you can, but, you know, uh, hopefully there's some nearby cities and I can advertise that, you know, the church is up and running and come out for Sunday service and all that kind of stuff. That would be cool. And yeah, it, it, it does sound uh, really cool. And you know, I'll have to have you come back and, and we we can actually uh, cover uh, part one of your, your book. Um, but he, you know, when you were uh, had your brief m- meeting with da- Dan Aykroyd, did he? Uh, and you just mentioned uh, the sky watches. You know, I just uh, wanted to go back to Dan real fast. Did uh, did, did he say anything about uh, his character Beldar and the cone heads from Saturday Night Live? <laughs> no, he did, but. Oh uh, my gosh! I just saw that movie the other night. I, it's, that's a great movie. Uh, that that character and the movies yeah. and how he got his start with that character on Saturday Night Live. But no, what we did talk about was uh, I had my Ghost Be Gone shirt on, and I waited in line to see him. And he was, you could get a free autographed copy of his father's book, uh, which was all about how his family, going way back to the spiritualist movement, were all involved in seances and speaking to the dead and ghost photography and spiritualist movement and all that, which helped him actually write Ghostbusters. So yeah, when I yeah, finally got to the front of the line, but you had to, you had to buy a case of the, of the vodka to get the book. And I just had one bottle in my hand. Actually, my wife had a bottle in each one of her hands. I had one in my hand. And then he saw that we only had the three bottles, but he saw my shirt and I started to talk to him about my team and he said, well, you're getting a book anyway. And the guy next to him, like one of his security people said, um, Dan, he's only got three bottles. He goes, the guy's getting a book. He signed, actually gave me two books. Gave me two books, both autographed, one to Ghost Be Gone, one to Sean. 
and uh, we talked a little bit of just about investigating um, and ghost hunting at that time, but no UFO stuff. But gosh, is, I don't know anybody that's more um, more intelligent on all that stuff. Everything, everything about everything under the paranormal umbrella, he is just totally uh, versed on. And not only because right. he's studies it and researches it, but he's experienced a ton of it. And he's just a cool dude, man. I mean, uh, it's Dan Aykroyd, but he'll just talk to you like he's just, you know, he's just one of the gang. Somebody you bumped into at a bar and shooting a game of pool with. He's just a cool guy. Yeah, he. I, I've um, heard him on you know, uh, an interview or two, and um, he, he uh, Dan, seems like he's a very intelligent person. Uh, even when he was creating uh, Beldar and the Coneheads in what, the late 70s, and he, he was uh, pretty up to, like, ahead of everyone else with the uh, elongated skulls. Do you remember That's the probably... movie he did where he had the wife from outer space? Really? Yeah. Like, the, the uh, cone heads in the look... movie. No, not the, not the cone heads. He was a regular, like, uh, ast- not astrologer. He was like a scientist, a regular dude, a doctor. And a woman came down from one. space and ended up becoming um, uh, an alien came down from space and took the form of a woman. Uh, Kim Bassinger was the woman. And she Is ends that up meeting Earth, Earth him. Girls Are Easy? I don't think it was Earth Girls Are Easy. It could have been. But I do know that he started it. Kim Bassinger plays the love interest in the alien. And there again, there's a lot of alien, ET, extraterrestrial, space knowledge thrown into this comedy. That's mm-hmm. for real, legit stuff, you know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he, he's he he knows what uh, for forty some years he he's been actually uh, on the cutting edge of. Uh, ET research. Uh, just, you know, looking back on you know just r- recent episodes of Ancient Aliens, it's like, oh, uh, they're. You know, now uh, that you say that, well, I think his movie might be something like I Married an Alien or something like that, or I Married a Woman from Outer Space or something like that. I'm going to look it up when we're uh, done tonight, but it's a good movie. Mm-hmm. It's really funny. Okay. Yeah. He. Yeah, he's. I, 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 I've always been impressed with his uh, and, and, and very intelligent man, uh, well spoken. He, he he knows what he's talking about. And I can't wait. I was glad I'm so excited for uh, the. Even though it seems to be geared more towards a younger audience. I'm really looking forward to Ghostbusters three. I think that's going to be great. Mm-hmm. And, and he, he was very supportive of the uh, a remake as well, with the uh, all all lady cast. Mm-hmm. Okay, so what? You know, Sean, we're down to uh, about three three to four minutes left. Um, is the Yeah, can, can you tell us about your website? Any you know, uh, you know your upcoming shows? Uh, you know, you've had uh, a good uh, discussion d- discussion last week with uh, uh, Susan about uh, uh, he- healing. Um, you know, so what are some other topics you have coming up in in the next well, couple anything- weeks? Anything. Anything anybody wants to know about me and my wife and our ministry is at www.ghost-b-gone.biz. There's a lot of cool things on there, but I also teach um, a 12-week college-level online uh, course called Introduction to Spiritual Warfare, 
uh, if you felt a calling to that ministry, you can en enroll in the course there at the website. I also have my book for sale on there, and that's God, Ghosts, and the Paranormal Ministry. You can get autographed copies enclosed in a house blessing kit on the website, or you can pick, purchase it a little less expensive on Amazon. But I have the Sunday show on Facebook Live, Reverend Sean Whittington's Paranormal Ministry, 5 p.m. Pacific on Sundays on Reverend Sean Whittington's Paranormal Ministry Facebook Live page. And then Monday nights, of course, 5 p.m. Pacific, I have Vegas Supernatural on KCORradio.com. And I'm having fun with both those shows, and uh, I'm still working a lot of uh, paranormal cases, and I'm not hard to find, and I'll talk to anybody about anything. And if you, you know, if anybody needs any help with any of that sort of stuff, just reach out to me, and uh, I'll do the very best I can to help you. And if I can't help you, I will do my very best to try and find somebody that can help you. Buyer beware on the book, though. There's a picture of an entity in that book that I captured at a uh, an abandoned location out in the middle of the desert. Small child, could be a girl or a, or a boy, we're not sure. We have seen that apparition here in the home many times. But some of the books that leave the home here that I've autographed that are purchased off the website, I've had some readers get in touch with me and say, since that book has arrived in my home, I've seen that apparition in my home, which I find mind-blowing that there might be a slight attachment to some of the books that have sat here in my office that eventually I autograph and send out. I have not had anybody that has purchased it on Amazon tell me that, but I find that amazing. Not a malevolent entity, nothing to be scared of. Mm. Even though my producer has gone on record and said my book's the scariest book, she ever produced. The book is a very different kind of feel-good story. There's a lot of good versus evil, but good wins a lot in it. So don't let that scare you off. And part of the okay. proceeds of every sale go to stjude.org and St. Jude's Children's Research Hospital in Nevada. And that's a beautiful thing. So that's a good deed right. for the day if you buy the book. Okay, great. And uh, we're down to just a few seconds, but uh, you were just talking about your producer. My producer just said the movie is My Stepmother is an Alien. Boom. That is it. <laughs> okay. My so, Stepmother uh, is an Alien. <laughs> yeah. So we are almost out of time. Thank you so much, Sean. Uh, let's see. We'll, we'll be back. Monday and Tuesday of next week with uh, some great guests. Um, thanks again, and enjoy the festivities, and we'll, we'll uh, talk next week. Th thank you again, Sean.